In July 2019, the U.S. government targeted America's biggest tech companies. The Department of Justice and the FTC appear to be looking at whether the leading tech platforms have used improper means to acquire monopoly positions or to exclude promising rivals from contesting their position. Translation. Are these companies too big? And did they get that way illegally? These questions fall under a set of laws that, until recently, had faded from the public spotlight. Antitrust has gone from being this completely sleepy backwater discipline that was, you know, just a few people talked about to being very much in the public news. We've really started to see a lot of discussion about does there need to be more enforcement of antitrust? Are we really enforcing these laws and using these tools in the way that they were intended to be? And it's not just tech. Antitrust concerns have arisen around other industries that are also dominated by a few huge companies, like domestic airlines, pharmaceuticals, telecommunications, and beer. There's always this kind of balance uh, between the desire for an efficient economy and this fear of what happens to, to society, to democracy, to the interest of consumers, the interest of labor. So we asked these experts to explain. What is antitrust anyway? The first federal antitrust law was passed in 1890, and two more followed in 1914. The antitrust laws started out as being against power and making it easier for little firms to get into the market and survive, as well as to cater to consumers. They sought to prevent companies from getting too big or engaging in unfair practices like colluding to fix prices. They also created an agency to enforce those standards. So the antitrust laws were a reaction to the industrialization of the late um, 19th century because of the perception that there was too much economic power over specific industries being concentrated in a few hands. People like John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan. Rockefeller and Morgan were part of a movement that thought bigger businesses were better businesses and monopolies were the best. Its followers believed in consolidating whole industries into single firms or grouping firms into trusts. From just 1895 to 1904, thousands of manufacturing firms merged into just 157 corporations. Morgan consolidated the steel, railroad, shipping, and electricity industries and inspired copycats in tobacco, rubber, film production, and more. But it was Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company that became the first blockbuster antitrust case. Rockefeller combined dozens of state-based companies like Standard Oil Company of Ohio, of Nebraska, etc., into one. By 1904, Standard Oil controlled 91% of oil production and 85% of sales. Following a searing expose of Standard Oil's business practices by journalist Ida Tarbell, President Teddy Roosevelt's administration filed an antitrust suit against the company in 1906. After a five-year court battle, the Supreme Court ordered the breakup of Standard Oil. Standard Oil was divested back into the local companies that had formed Standard Oil in the first place. Over time, of course, we get these companies beginning to compete with each other, we have new companies entering the market, and we get a much more competitive uh, oil industry, but that took a long time to happen. Innovation boomed, and the overall value of the industry actually increased, as did Rockefeller's stock in the new companies. A flurry of antitrust activity followed. By the end of the 1910s, most of the major trusts had been broken up or regulated in some other way under antitrust law. But this aggressive approach ended when World War I began. And after the U.S. entry into the war, the view was, boy, we just cannot afford to have antagonism between the federal government and big business. This shift highlights a key theme of U.S. antitrust law. How it's enforced, or whether it's enforced at all, depends heavily on the political will of the agencies, courts, and president. The guidance in the laws is more than any other area of federal law exceedingly broad and in many instances vague. There's a difference between having a law on the books and having a law actually be enforced. The regulatory agencies can do with the law what they want. President Franklin D. Roosevelt briefly revived aggressive antitrust enforcement to energize the struggling Depression-era economy. 
But he too put it aside when World War II began. This time, though, the end of the war sparked the most aggressive period of antitrust enforcement to date. The stage had been set in Hitler's Germany. By 1933, when Hitler comes to power, uh, the German economy is extremely concentrated. We have these big monopolies in chemicals and steel and electricity um, and, and, and coal and other, and other important industries. Then Secretary of War Kenneth Royal put it bluntly in a report that these monopolies soon got control of Germany, brought Hitler to power, and forced virtually the whole world into war. The United States was very concerned that our country could tip towards fascism or communism if we didn't have and nurture a competitive, diverse society. Congress passed another act in 1950 to strengthen the mandate against mergers. This, combined with an extremely liberal Supreme Court, kicked off the era of peak antitrust, one where the FTC and the courts became extremely skeptical of any mergers that resulted in a larger market share for one company. Really in the 50s and 60s, many, many cases were brought to stop mergers, even mergers that today we think of would not be problematic at all. The blockbuster case of this era was AT&T. AT&T had been the sole supplier of phone service in the U.S. for decades. The Department of Justice filed an antitrust suit in 1974. And ultimately, in 1982, that case was settled in the Reagan administration uh, with a decree that broke up AT&T. And the idea was to create a more competitive telecommunications market by infusing competition into those markets. That sounds like a success for supporters of aggressive antitrust, right? Strictly speaking, it was. AT&T's decades-long monopoly over phone service ended. But it also marked the end of the aggressive antitrust era and the beginning of the standard we have today. Let's back up a bit. A conservative backlash against extremely aggressive antitrust enforcement had been brewing as early as the 1950s, driven by scholars at the University of Chicago. They argued that big mergers could provide better efficiency and innovation. So there was a big movement to cut back the antitrust laws that would say firms need a lot of room to do what they want to do. Instead, these scholars proposed that antitrust suits only be brought against businesses if their actions had caused consumer harm. For example, if two businesses merged and caused products to get more expensive or worse, or if the new company somehow stifled innovation in the industry. The Supreme Court adopted this consumer welfare standard in the 1979 case Reader versus Sonatone. It fairly abruptly sort of announces that it's shifting its direction and accepting that this so-called consumer welfare standard is the goal of antitrust law. And when Americans voted conservative Ronald Reagan into office the following year, the fate of aggressive antitrust enforcement was sealed. Reagan campaign was based on the fact that government had become too intrusive into business. So this sentiment built up and Reagan ran on the ticket to get government off the back of business. And that won the day. That sentiment won the day and the next few decades of antitrust enforcement. The Department of Justice did bring a size-based antitrust case against Microsoft in the late 1990s, which we'll explore in another video along with its effects on the current antitrust investigations of big tech. But for the most part, antitrust enforcement based on the size of companies has been essentially dormant for the last 40 years. And I think you saw antitrust be consumed with or be captured by a very fundamental free market ideology that caused regulators to put a heavy thumb on the scales in favor of business, in favor of letting mergers go through, in favor of letting monopolists do whatever they wanted. This is obvious if we zoom out and look at some key data on the U.S. economy. Between 1982 and 2012, market concentration across all of these industries increased, sometimes by triple digit percentages. Between 1996 and 2016, the number of companies on the stock market fell by half, 
Also since 1996, the FTC has challenged fewer and fewer proposed mergers that would leave only five or six major firms in an industry. Which is why there are now only four major domestic airlines, four major telecommunications carriers, three major drugstores, and two major beer retailers. What we had at the turn of the 19th century, and we have again now, is companies that have a significant influence over the entire economy. This has experts wondering, is this another inflection point for antitrust law? Should these laws once again be skeptical of business size, or should they leave these businesses alone? It feels like this is the first time in 40 years that antitrust has a real moment to decide what it's going to be for the next 40 years. At times I think that antitrust is portrayed as this, like I said, magic bullet, so to speak, of that if we just break up the companies, all these other problems that we're concerned about would go away. But there's no guarantee of that. Antitrust has intervened at different times to create possibilities for much greater innovation, much more robust competition. I think there is a broad sense, even in the U.S., that something has gone wrong in these markets, that something needs to change. One way to think about it is between the ends, well, the, on one side that we have aggressive antitrust, on the other side that we don't have antitrust, there's a big spectrum, and we probably want to find some point on this spectrum. We will never be in the perfect point, but this to be on the spectrum is better than being on one of the ends.